uh, it's a, just a cleanup that was regarding um, a provision that was inadvertently changed back when we did the uh, grand jury bill. Two years ago, this bill went through last year. It didn't get completed. So we're putting it through again this year to put back in Section A, which was taken out inadvertently in Code Section 15-16-21, dealing with <coughs> fees of the sheriff. As all sheriffs are on salary in the state now, there is no fee system, and this is just to have that as a part of the code provision. And I will be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. If not, the chair will entertain a motion. We have a motion to pass, second to it. Any discussion on the motion? Any amendments? Not the chair will call the main question, which is a motion do pass House Bill uh, 228, which is LC 40 0771. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Who do we have here? Hello there, Miss Travis. I got started a little early. Mr. Strickland. You're here on your foreclosure bill, which is House Bill 322-LC-2964-73-S. Please have a seat, and you have a copy of your bill. If you'd like to, go ahead and proceed with presenting your bill. Mr. Chairman, I'll follow the same lead you took to keep this short and sweet. I bring to you House Bill 322 and it's by substitute from subcommittee. And what the problem we're trying to address with this bill <laughs> under 4414-160, we have in the law a 90-day deadline for the filing of deeds under power. Uh, of course, this is a document that's filed following a foreclosure sale. And one thing I've learned in the off-season before session, I was <coughs> approached by some folks from GMA, and we learned that around the state we have issues with vacant lots in cities and of course in counties as well but um, there are many stories we shared in subcommittee from cities like Griffin, Centerville, Atlanta, Douglasville, Johns Creek um, all that had vacant lots and they try to go and deal with um, issues with overgrowth in the lots they so go you to want site to compel the them to record those deeds in a timely manner that's correct sir. thank you happy to answer any questions any questions <laughs> Any questions of the presenter? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> if not, I think we have some others who would like to speak on the bill on the sheet. If I'll bring, call uh, Todd Edwards up. Mr. Edwards, you're present with us. You want to come up? And I believe we have Marcy Rubenstein and Rubenstein. Excuse me. Y'all come up and we'll <laughs> let y'all sing together. I'm thinking, we don't very, have but one brief. chair there, do we? <laughs> Why don't I Would you bring the other chair over? Uh, <coughs> we'll have that. And Ladies, we got a full no, no. chorus now. See, so we'll pull those mic, pull that mic up, Marcy. We'll glad to hear from you. Uh, Todd Edwards with the Association uh, County Commissioners of Georgia ACCG is proud to support uh, House Bill 322. I uh, had spoken with the uh, bill's author, uh, representatives of the Municipal Association and members of this committee seeking one amendment to the bill basically states that the uh, clerk uh, can collect a 5% administrative fee on behalf of all those fees or fine monies dead care sent back to the cities. I'd appreciate y'all's consideration all for right. that amendment. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Marcy Rubinson with the Georgia Municipal Association. We think that this legislation is going to cure a very significant problem in cities where we have trouble tracking down the owner of a foreclosed property. This legislation will um, impose some penalties. Both that, local governments yes. are supportive of the bill. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience wish to speak on uh, House Bill 322? If not, you do. Please. I'm sorry. <laughs> Come around. I, I, I didn't realize you were here. Mr. Chairman, Elizabeth Apley for Housing Georgia, Statewide Affordable Housing Coalition. We support the bill and thank the author for bringing it. Thank you publicly for my Valentine candy. <laughs> <laughs> now everyone knows you're my Valentine. <laughs> Anyone else? If not, we'll close off further public comment. The bill is now in the breast of the committee. Is there any discussion among committee members? We have discussion by Mr. Welch. 
Uh, well, yes, sir. I'll, just at the appropriate time, I have a, an amendment proposal. Okay. Here. We don't have any other discussion. The chair will entertain a motion, first of all. Motion do pass. Second. It's been seconded. <laughs> Any discussion on the motion or amendments? Do we have amendments, Mr. Welch? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I, we have a we have a in the folder a proposed amendment um, that I, needs a little work, um, to say the least. And this would be an amendment that I think is okay. going to be more proper to put. Um, You're at HB 322 AM 1? Yes, sir, that's correct. Um, but even this amendment needs some work. Um, so I would propose that the the amendment, the amending language, um, beginning on line 5 of the amendment, uh, be inserted. It says it's inserted between purposes and the period on line 35, but we don't have a 35 in this bill. So No, you don't. It really needs to come after the period on line 32. Uh, All right, so what you're saying is after penalty period. <coughs> that's correct. Then beginning on line five, your amendment would, would be inserted. That's correct, except that I would insert the, uh, instead of um, the provided, however, that, I would strike all that and just begin with the capital F for four. And then I think um, Chairman Jacobs has a few additional amendments he would like to add to that. Well, is it. Is I'm sorry, do I misunderstood that you're having a different amendments? This is an amendment to the amendment. All right, so let me get your amendment, Mr. Welch, stated. We're talking about adding after on line 32 the word penalty, period. The beginning phrase you have is line 5, provided, comma, however, and reading further, correct? For this purpose, yes, then, we'll, then Mr. Jacobs will make yeah. a subsequent amendment. Now you're going to have... Potentially another amendment to your amendment. Okay. Yes, sir. Mr. Well, let's first get the motion on the, the amendment. Do we have a uh, motion to adopt the amendment, the Welch Amendment? So moved. And I'll moved second and seconded. It. Any, any further discussion or amendments on the amendment? I, I have an amendment to the amendment. Hold All right. one. <laughs> All right. Um, Mr. Chairman, what I would propose to do is strike, and this is all as one amendment, uh, just to, to cut down on the language here because there's just too much. Um, strike provided however that and the semicolon. And so we're going to start, we're going to leave that period at the end of line 32 in the bill. Strike right. pr provided however that, then make that a capital F. For, and then on line six of the amendment, strike any and make it A. Insert after the comma, the county governing authority may withhold. Uh, what line was this? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, on the amendment. Oh, uh, okay. What line on the amendment? I'm six. Asking. Line six. We had a striking of any and inserting A, and what was the next part? The next thing is the before A5%. All right. And do we do a, we, we spell out five at that level, right, Ms. Travis? That's correct. Okay. So. Uh, no, no, no. We use the number before the word percent. Okay. All right. Um, then uh, before A5%, insert the county governing authority may withhold a five and then it continues on strike shall be withheld on line s and then we're on line seven on line <coughs> seven add a period after municipality and then strike the balance of the amendment so it would read as follows for each late filing penalty for property located within the corporate limits of a municipality comma the county governing authority may withhold a 5% administrative processing fee from the remittance to such municipality period. All right. And then striking the rest after <coughs> municipality. Correct. Second. <coughs> do you have that, Ms. Travis? I do. Okay. Questions of members of the uh, <coughs> committee? Anyone have any further questions about it? Does everyone understand the amendment? Is there a second to the amendment to the amendment? Second. There's been a motion to s on a second amendment. Any discussion on the second amendment to the, I mean, the amendment to the amendment, <coughs> excuse me, 
If not, the chair will call the question on the amendment to the amendment. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed like sign. Motion carries. We're back now to the main amendment as amended. Is there any discussion on the amendment? If not, the chair will call the question on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed like sign. Amendment carries. To the main question, which is the motion due pass on House Bill 322 as amended as a committee substitute. Do we have any further discussion on the motion? Not the chair will call the main question to do pass HB 322, which is LC 2964 73S. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Now, do we have, I'm looking down the list here, Mr. Reeves? Yes, Mr. Chairman. You present? We'll take up L. I'm sorry, HB 295, which is LC 362757ERS. <coughs> Mr. Reeves, this is your bill. Let's see. Yep. Yeah. Please proceed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Um, we are here again on this bill. We were here a few days ago, and there were some current concerns on a few sections or two sections, and so we went back to a subcommittee and one of the sections of concern we just removed all together and are going to go back um, and work on and prepare another bill for next year with that so the last area of concern is what is going to be in um, the bill you are looking at under part three and I don't think chairman Weldon is here um, but in our last committee hearing um, he had expressed some concern with changing from instead of serving two copies on the Secretary of State, the Secretary of State wanted to um, change that to be consistent with other codes and just have one copy served. Let me ask quickly, you go through from beginning part one, what you're looking at, because I don't think this committee has had a full review of it completely, have they? Well, we have, we went over uh, part one and two so is yeah, the same as, as when we were here earlier this week for the full committee. Did we make some other changes back on section two, though? We didn't. It's, it's, Did uh, left it. Sections one and two are the same as they were. All right. What was previously section three has been removed completely, and what was previously section four is now or part three. I'm okay. sorry. What was previously part four is now part three. All right. And so part, what we are looking at now with part three, um, Chairman Weldon had some concerns about the um, changing number of, copies. number of copies. That's right. And so we went back and, and took a hard look at it. This is consistent with the practice the Secretary of State uses. It's also consistent with other sections of law in our code. Um, if anybody needs to hear more details about that, we can, we're certainly able to present that. All right. Any questions of? Members of the committee, <coughs> if not, thank you, Mr. Reeves. Is there anyone else who would wishes to speak on uh, HB 295-LC 362757-ERS? If not, we will close all further public input. The uh, bill is now in the breast of the committee. Any discussion among committee members? If not, the chair will entertain a motion. Motion is due pass. I believe this was a committee substitute. Motion is due pass for the committee substitute of House Bill 295. Any further discussion? Any amendments to be proposed? If not, the chair will call the main question. Due pass House Bill 295. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Kelly, you're here. You want to talk about 342? No, you can, you can uh, present from your chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's House Bill 342, which is LC 296424S. <coughs> yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I am before you with a substitute to House Bill 342, uh, which uh, recognizes a, a, a compromise reach between uh, members from our, our plaintiffs bar and our, our nursing home industry really tackling two issues mr. chairman uh, the first one deals with um, 
the first section uh, really of the, of the bill, uh, lines 12 through uh, 16, really focuses on violations of either federal or state uh, regulations that are typically used for, for payer guidelines and says that no longer will the simple breaking of one of those regulations lead to a per se negligence charge. However, it does provide that uh, any violation of that should uh, still be allowed to be admitted into evidence. And then the second uh, really function of the bill focuses on uh, the surveys that are often taken of our uh, nursing home facilities and says that if in an advertisement uh, someone wants to reference one of these surveys uh, that they need to include uh, several other uh, pieces of information so that uh, the, the full uh, story is seen behind any of the, those violations. Thank you. Any questions of uh, Mr. <coughs> Kelly, presenter, by members of the committee? You have a question? I, 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 sir, uh, I do. It, it may also be in the form of a statement, but the author is welcome to respond to it if he, if he wishes. Um, I am going to propose an amendment at the appropriate time that that would uh, uh, have the uh, this the bill apply to uh, a cause and be effective upon the governor's signature, but apply only to causes of action that arise after um, such time. Um, the I, I, I'm I'm concerned that if we you know if this would go into effect on July 1st, and if that that occurs. Um, we're we're basically cutting off the rights of folks who may have a cause of action uh, at that time, unless we're clear that we're going to, you know, allow those existing causes of action to run off, um, you know, in the normal course of things um, through a statute of limitations. So um, my my strong preference would be that we. I mean, I don't I don't mind the bill becoming effective immediately, but I think it should only apply to affect the rights of people which may arise after the effective date of the bill um, rather than the rights of people that existed before. And then the, the rights that existed before um, obviously would run off by, by virtue of the statute of limitations. And I don't know if the author has any Isn't response to that. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, we've, uh, you know, this, is, this is the, um, you know, the, the, the what we had discussed, I understand Chairman Jacobs' concerns because I, 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 I do think you're, you're probably talking about a substantive issue. I think probably a, a court would probably say that uh, I think a court would probably hold exactly with what, with what you're saying. I think probably your, your amendment I would consider friendly because I think it would just prevent any, any future. I'm, I'm sure litigation. Judge Boyette will agree with me that uh, if it's substantive, as far as rights of the party, it can't be changed by a law being changed if it's procedural. That is something that becomes only as of that time and, and goes forward. And I completely agree with you. There we are. <coughs> Thank you. And I certainly agree with it. <laughs> oh, another? I'm sorry. I see you back there. Sir, and. <laughs> You're well hit. You're well hit. You to get behind the pole here. <laughs> <laughs> certainly agree with that as a substantive matter, Mr. Chairman. I just don't want anybody litigating, litigating over it. True. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have, I believe, Mr. Jason Bring. Mr. Uh, Bring. Yes, yes, sir. Please come forward. Uh, thank you, sir. Identify yourself and who you represent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, my name is Jason Bring. I'm with Arnold Golden Gregory and here on behalf of the Georgia Healthcare Association. Pleased to be here today, and as Representative Kelly indicated, this uh, bill, as drafted, went through uh, intense negotiations, and I would say uh, Bill would probably agree with me uh, a rather, rather fragile, uh, you know, agreement that we were we were anxious and happy to to reach with the trial lawyers, um, including uh, all parts of the bill, and including specifically the effective component. Um, I, I think under the law, and you you made it clear whether it's procedural or substantive, and we think in our sense it's procedural, in that these are conditions of payment. They are not a mandatory regulation, which is what would trigger a, um, 
a substantive right under the law that would allow <coughs> some cause of action, um, you know, th under the effective provision. So that's why that's uh, neutral on that right now, and that was part of our overall negotiation okay. and agreement with the trial lawyers, and we're pleased to have worked with them and come to that collaborative yeah. um, arrangement. Happy to address any questions about the bill. Thank you, Mr. Breen. I'm going to ask Mr. Jacobs to uh, assume the chair, if you will. I've got to go to upstairs to present the bill. I'll be back hopefully quickly. Questions for the witness? Representative Welch. I, I wasn't clear, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and, to th and to the gentleman. I, I appreciate you being here. Are you were you coming on the amendment itself as to whether it was that that was endangering <coughs> the agreement that you had with trial lawyers or not? Uh, it, yes, in, in fact, that that was one of the points that was negotiated, and um, we agreed to to leave that neutral. And, and so that was, if it is proposed as an amendment, um, we would ask that it not be included because we, it, you know, I guess the research shows at least on one side that it's not a substantive right. These are conditions of payment for participation of nursing homes in the Medicare program. They don't apply to every nursing home per se, so they're not mandatory regulations that would trigger um, a negligence per se charge. And, and the courts have really wavered on that so far, so it's not taking away a negligence per se uh, right that necessarily exists is not modifying the negligence per se statute is more procedural or evidentiary in nature so that was point of negotiation so we ask that that, that amendment not be included so that we do continue to, to kind of maintain what is a you know a, a rare bird in the sense of, of the two organizations having worked together so strongly to reach this agreement but you will agree that there would be litigation over that point there, right? there may be any further questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony you. today. I don't have anyone else signed up to speak on the bill. Does anyone else wish to testify on the bill? Seeing none, the chair calls the question on the bill. That uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't give call the question. Uh, we're done with uh, discussion. <laughs> um, so we'll uh, now uh, the bill is in the hands of the committee. Uh, do I hear a motion? Moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Um, the author of the amendment is now sitting in the chair, so I cannot propose the amendment. I'll propose uh, it. All right. There is a motion on the amendment. Is there a second? There is a motion and a second on the, the amendment. Any discussion on the amendment? I'm, I Representative Oliver. Just for clarity, I, I wasn't e exactly sure if, if you were saying uh, your industry's agreement to this bill, negotiated agreement to this bill, is off, is gone if this amendment is adopted. That's not what you said, and I haven't heard from the gentleman you were negotiating with. So, I, I'd like to hear, Mr. Clark, because we we agreed on this, and and, and that was part of the, the deal that we agreed on. So, um, and it was a negotiated point. Well, I hate to press on this if it would be better not said here, but, uh, but I wasn't clear about what you're. Yeah, I, I don't have authority to. Back okay. So give me, Mr. Chair, I didn't mean to call on a witness. It's your authority. No, that's perfectly fine, and I don't know <coughs> if the, you want to make any response, Mr. Clark. We have to, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we support hey, wait, the why don't we get to the microphone, though? Certainly. Since we are broadcasting worldwide. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bill Clark, on behalf of the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association, we have negotiated this. Uh, we agree with the legal arguments that have been made uh, about uh, giving up the right to have a negligence per se charge and to bring a negligence per se claim is a substantive <coughs> right. So some judge is going to decide this issue if you don't. But it was, in fact, an issue that uh, was in a large basket of items that were negotiated, uh, and we yielded uh, uh, to their wishes on, on this item. Uh, so we, we support the bill, and uh, I think that's all that I, I need to say. All right. Questions for Mr. Clark? All right. Thank Representative you, Mr. Chairman. Evans waves. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Clark. 
All right, so the bill, the posture we were in, we had moved the bill and the amendment has been moved. So we're on discussion on the amendment. Representative Evans. And my question is for the chair about the purpose of the amendment. I understood the purpose of the amendment to, for us as representatives to do our job to make legislation as clear as we can for the courts who will ultimately at some point have to read it and the parties who will have to litigate it. So I appreciate the, the issues that have been debated out in the halls. Um, and obviously the industries that are involved are, are important, but I feel like our job is to make legislation clear. And I was wondering if that was your purpose or how you were feeling after the recent presentations about the amendment. I think it makes the legislation, I mean, the, this is me speaking in a, as, as an individual legislator who actually authored the amendment. Um, I, I think it makes the, uh, the legislation clear. I think it cuts down on the possibility of litigation over whether this is a substantive right. Um, and, you know, the, the, the causes of action that exist on the effective date of the bill, which will be the governor's signature, so as soon as it could possibly mm -hmm. be. Um, will will run out will run off by virtue of the statute of limitations. I think it's a good way to handle it. That's crystal clear. Thank you. Any further discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, the chair calls the question on the amendment. All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The in the opinion of the chair, the am there's two no's. Yeah, that's in the opinion of the chair, the the amendment carries. <coughs> Um, any further amendments or discussion? Seeing none, the chair calls the question on the bill. That's to give a due pass recommendation to the committee substitute to House Bill 342 as amended by the committee. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The bill moves forward to rules with a due pass recommendation. What else? Coomer's not going to be here. I'm going to talk for his bill. I'm one of the signers down the line on it. This is House Bill 98. This is the codification update of the Military Code of Justice, what we call the Georgia Code of Military Justice. Uh, the, the laws that we had in place <coughs> dealing with our primarily the National Guard component <clears throat> goes back to the uh, 50s and so the group of individuals who were involved with the National Guard <clears throat> and other military personnel working with uh, Representative Coomer have gone through a rewrite and updating of the uh, code and this is House Bill's 98th purpose is a fairly extensive bill. We had some uh, hearings and subcommittee. I believe it was in Jacob's <coughs> subcommittee. Fleming. Nope. Fleming. Fleming's. And Fleming's not here. Who was on that committee? Is, if you might recall. Mr. Chairman, Judge. I was not on that committee, but I was on the study committee that wrote right. the bill. Okay. So, But I was not on the Fleming committee. No, uh, you want to add committee. to the uh, comments that I just gave about what we're doing with this bill? Well, basically, it, it does a, several things, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's a cleanup, number one, of old existing law that basically doesn't apply anymore. But further than that, since the National Guard has been called up so many times into action and federalized, they were operating under federal law, and then the uh, veterans or the people of the National Guard were then operating under Georgia law. And there was a conflict in the laws concerning procedural acts, uh, civil acts, criminal acts, <coughs> and basically what we were trying to do was to make them all consistent with one another and basically use the federal code in the majority of the times 
and also having to do with jurisdiction because they would they could be called up and sent to uh, Texas as they were for the uh, to guard the border. Yes. And if they committed an act out there, were you then they are prosecuted under federal law? Were you going to be prosecuted under Texas law? Or you going to be prosecuted under Georgia law? And this bill cleans up all of that. It makes it all into one so that everything that a National Guard member does is now under Georgia law, and it's basically uh, similar to the uh, judicial, the not judicial, but the, uh, the, the model act of uh, states as well as the federal act uh, for uh, people in, in service. But it cannot exceed a 10-year penalty for anything that, that should happen if it was a criminal act if it anything that should exceed 10 years, then it would go into the superior courts as any other criminal case and be handled the same way. But this just gets to the court martials of uh, what it does. Great. And uh, we note that Ms. Travis vote, uh, wrote the bill, so we know it was done correctly. And you have a question, Mr. Jacobs? Or is it you? I'm sorry, Ms. Oliver. Uh, <coughs> Judge Caldwell, benefit of the study committee is very helpful just as a study committee, as a Fleming subcommittee person, uh, we had very helpful testimony from a number of different individuals who were involved in perfecting this model act. It's a model act for Georgia. And based on the chairman's consideration, we did add some language on page 17 lines uh, 554 through 563 uh, relating to GCIC. That, that was uh, one of the amendments that you offered that perfected the bill. Thank you. At appropriate time, I'll move to pass, Mr. Chairman. And I might right. say, Mr. Chairman, if I might, also the uh, Court of Appeals were involved in this. We brought uh, two of the members of the Court of Appeals down so that because this also, also calls for an appeal process, right. and they also were in agreement and consent with it. Very good. Thank you, Judge. Anyone else have uh, comments, uh, wish to address House Bill 98 in the audience? If not, we'll close off further public comment. The bill is now in the breast of the committee. The, the discussion among the committee members, if not, the chair will entertain a motion. <coughs> motion is due passed. The second it. Any discussion on the motion? If not, any amendments? No amendments. The chair will call the main question, which is due passed. House Bill 98 as a committee substitute. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Uh, Mr. Spencer, we're going to take your bill up next. House Bill 17. If you'd like to come up and be the presenter of it. <coughs> Please proceed. Make sure I have the, the new. Um, Good question. We're One dealing with LC 296537S. Okay. You have a copy of it? I do. I have All it right, right here. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, we've we've had four tough hearings on this bill, and uh, it was necessary. And I think we're getting close to a balance um, on the language. And uh, I want to start, some of the committee members have not heard the uh, testimony in the four subcommittee sure. hearings. So <coughs> I'm, I want to be as brief as I can so that we can get into the discussion of the bill and entertain any questions that any of you might have. Um, I'll just sort of give a quick reason as to why I'm bringing this bill. Um, right now, we have a problem with uh, child sexual abuse survivors not gaining access to the courts and that is because we have a very short civil statute of limitation and the current policy in Georgia does not reflect reality out there uh, amongst our citizens w that are victims and survivors of child sexual abuse. Um, what I am asking the committee to do is to open up and unlock the courts to some survivors who have compelling evidence to bring to a court of law to discover truth uh, to expose hidden predators that live amongst us that will never be put on a uh, sex offender registry or they will never be put in jail on criminal charges. 
So that is why I bring this bill. Um, <coughs> so to get into the bill, um, you will see that uh, starting on section one, we call it the Hidden Predator Act, because that's what this bill is trying to do, is to point out those predators that still live amongst us. Um, <coughs> section two is essentially a sort of a rewrite of a, or enumeration of all of the crimes that uh, occur and so we want to include them in the statute um, that define childhood sexual abuse. So that's what these crimes are actually uh, there for. So, but getting into the, the actual meat of the bill and what I'm trying to do is starting at line 64. And that talks about, that's the tolling statute that it references. And then I'm, this would actually, uh, this bill would start after July 1st, 2015. Um, but the current statute of limitations in Georgia is eight, uh, age of majority plus five, which is currently 23 years. And that's simply what we state here on line 67 is on or before the date of the plaintiff attains the age of 23 or, and this is where we open up the courts for victims. It's what I call the discovery plus two rule here. <coughs> it says within two years from the date that the plaintiff knew or had reason to know of such abuse and that abuse resulted in injury, then the victim or the plaintiff uh, can that has to be ascertained through a competent medical evaluation or psychological evaluation. So one can look at this as a, an opportunity for the, uh, the victim to come forward and to uh, make a claim against their perpetrator. Uh, because the, the reason why we are allowing, we, I want to allow this to happen is because all the research shows that most childhood sexual abuse victims will not come forward <laughs> until they're in their 40s. Uh, it's still an evolving area of research, but the the totality of research out there currently, the average age is somewhere around 42. That's what we know now. So this would open up the courts, and this would allow victims who have compelling evidence to bring forward in civil actions because they are currently locked out of the courts. So that's the idea behind that language. Um, going forward into the bill uh, in line 71, and uh, this is where we, uh, again, we're talking about um, the discovery process. And there is a pretrial finding of discovery. Uh, we talked about that in committee. And also, as we move down, uh, we start to define entity and person. And, and that can be uh, the, and, and we start moving to a paragraph here on line 82 on the standards, the evidentiary standards applied to the person or the perpetrator in this case, and the entity or negligent entity. So the first one is obviously the preponderance of evidence against the perpetrator. The second is a, a clear and convincing uh, standard that is applied to the entity. Um, and then we again move down into what the pretrial findings uh, are required. Uh, and it has to be, that determination has to be made in a six months time period by the judge. So it just can't languish out there. In section three, we're just uh, citing the tolling language. Um, Four, very similarly, <coughs> in section five, um, what we're doing here is we are, what we have, we have a, we have a problem in the code where uh, victims who want to take their acts to court, their claims to court, they need, they need the evidence. But right now, uh, they cannot get access to those records because um, the law, which is in 49.540, does not per permit victims to have access to those records if they were subject of an investigation, like a GBI case or even DVAX case or whatever. Uh, an investigatory authority cannot release those records. So that is evidence for those victims. And so what I want to try to do is open that up and allow the victim to have access to that record if they're subject of an investigation when the criminal case has closed or their guardian, their legal guardian. Um, so that's, in, in essence, the bill uh, in summary. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's the presentation. <coughs> Thank you. Um, we have questions of the presenter, Mr. Weldon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you, you mentioned just now that a a victim of uh, child sexual abuse would not have access to GBI or or sheriff's office or police records, and and. I'm trying to make sure I get the scenario that you're considering. What, what what you're saying, it's not a cold case. It's a case that's been closed. Correct. 
And then b because of the nature of the information regarding a child, at the time it wouldn't be available. Is that right? My understanding of this part of the law is that when you're trying, when the victim, anyone that's trying to get a, that record, uh, they cannot do that under this code section. But this is a closed case, right? This is a, this is a case that's not been prosecuted. It's closed. Yeah. And I, I just, I guess I'm not Is your question, is clear. a closed case, is there a denial or ability of the state to deny access to those records? Well, my, my, I guess I would think that that <coughs> closed investigation would be subject to open records. Well, here, here, here's the illustration that we find ourselves in in, in my district. No. Maybe that, maybe that can help you understand why I'm asking for this change. Um, the DA in my district uh, had ev enough evidence, uh, GBI evidence. They brought it to her, and because she could not prosecute criminally, um, because the statute of criminal statute of limitation had expired in 2000 or uh, had expired when these acts occurred. So in 2012, we changed that on the criminal justice, some of our criminal justice reform. So when records were trying to be obtained from the DA to release those records that she had evidence to, and these cases were well out of statute, and there's, they could not prosecute, she could not prosecute, then the question is, was why can't she release these records to the victims? You know, they're asking for these records, but she can't. She cites Code Section 49540 and states that she's not able to release the records, and that's why I'm bringing this forward. Is that what you're looking at, Mr. I'm, I'm looking it up. Go ahead. 49, 5, 4, Ms. Oliver? Okay. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like to, if I may, answer what I think is the answer to Representative Weldon's question, but I'm happy to be corrected by Chairman looking at the statute. I have, I have litigated this section on behalf of a parent whose other, other parent of a child was accused of abuse. My parent was never accused of abuse and we couldn't get his own records after a court litigation because the federal law, the federal statute regulations around child abuse records um, is, is, is regarded as being determinative, dispositive, even if it's within the file of a district attorney. So I think that's the answer to your question, Representative Weldon, and there's a lot of controversy about that just leave it at that. But I've I've lost that case <coughs> myself in court. Yeah, this, if I might pick up with that uh, statement, we're dealing with <coughs> Article Two under Title Forty Nine Five Dash Forty, and uh, this is title entitled Child Abuse and Deprivation Records. And the first thing they go through under Section Forty <coughs> is the defining what may constitute those type of records, and there is a statement as to the limitation of those records not being available practically any time to the public but then you have under section 41 the conditions under which records can be obtained and of course one of those sections is a court by subpoena upon its finding that access to such records may be necessary for determination of an issue before such court provide however that the court shall examine such record in camera unless the court determines that public disclosure of the information contained therein is necessary for the resolution of the issue then before it and the record is otherwise admissible under the rules of evidence. And of course then you have the ability of a grand jury and district attorney to obtain those records. The question I would look at is, is we're dealing with a civil issue mm -hmm. as opposed to the criminal right. conduct so we're back to really the the provision that addresses the access to those being through a court having first made a threshold determination that those records need to be accessed to make a decision regarding a claim and issues before the court. <coughs> My point is I think we may be outside the boundaries of what we can do with what we're saying here without having a court order allowing it to be done for a civil action. This, this. So make sure I, I hear you. You're saying that that cannot be released unless subpoenaed. That's right. Okay. I mean, well, we got we've got in the law <coughs> the means by which those records can be obtained. So, and and so if a victim <coughs> wanted to have access to these records that they're it's not, not they not still are not. It, as as far as I know, um, I, I've been told we are the only state that does this. I, I, 
I'm I don't not, know. I'm that. not sure. I don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not doing a study of the other yeah. states. I'm saying yeah. what we've got is a a pretty well established procedure that's been on the books with our state. Let's see how long. Um, it started back in 1975. Of course, there's been amendments over the years, but we've had at least declarations as to what uh, these records may be obtained or not obtained. And, that, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a public need and policy behind that, I'm, I'm suggesting. And it, I believe it's all federally, federal policy set forth. Mr. Chairman, if I may, yes, um, Mr. Um, Subcommittee Chairman Fleming is with us now. I, and I think Ms. Beskin and I were the only members here that were on the subcommittee that we had four hearings and eight to ten hours of testimony. And um, it's, hard, it's going to be very hard for the committee, probably, who didn't sit through those to... Yes, let's chair ask about uh, we're calling you Cole, but we're dealing with HB 17 and the issues under Section 5, which is the right of access by parties to records which are normally looked upon as being under the law <coughs> section on child abuse and deprivation records and how and under what purpose someone could have access to those records I don't did your committee go into that or look at it no sir we, we we talked about it but but yeah. that is not was not the focus of, of our um, of our multiple hours hearings well we'll go back as a committee and discuss that when we get into consideration on the bill but it's one I think we all had got caught on that for a second um, we were having questions of did you have something further mr. Weldon yes mr. all right have a seat <coughs> thank Proceed. you that was I appreciate the chair engaging that um one of the things that i i see in this bill is that um under the definition of childhood sexual abuse that include it, it, it says it includes anything that would be which act would be in violation of subparagraph three on line 32 on page 2 of the bill says statutory rape is prohibited, prohibited in code section 1663 uh, line please sir, 32 line, line 32, 32 okay. yes sir. and I, I'm looking at uh, statutory rape section right here 1663 and uh, what it says is that it, it a person commits offense statutory rape when he or she engages in sexual intercourse with any person under the age of 16 years and not his or her spouse, provided that no conviction shall be had for this offense on the unsupported testimony of the victim. So uh, then it goes down and uh, uh, in subparagraph B, Yeah, I'm in the Romeo and Juliet yeah, situation. Okay. Ah. Okay, that's that's where I want. That's what I want to do. Thank you. All right, good. Any further questions of the presenter at this time? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Spencer. Is there those in the audience who would like to speak on House Bill 17? I have a Alan. Is it Fowler? Fountain. Fountain. Would you like to come forward, Ms. Fountain? Due to the lateness of the hour, I hope you'll be able to maintain maintain uh, brief comments, please. Sure, sure. Have a seat. Give us your name uh, and who you, who you represent. Uh, my name is Alan Fountain. I'm a uh, victim of a serial predator for uh, in, in the mid-70s. 
I came back to Georgia, left my life in California and Florida because it was imperative, according to my clinical therapist, that until I got closure from this, that my life would always be in disarray and my life would be in danger from the consequences of self-medicating and pain. My problem is, is I joined this effort uh, two years ago. My problem is, is that I don't feel like that all the citizens of Georgia are being heard and voiced. I tried to join the committee and was initially on the committee who drafted the bill and I feel that I was removed for meritless reasons and it became a private club where the law was being tailored to unique individuals and not the Georgia citizens at large. I've created a following social media of voices that are not being represented. The bill that was drafted was a brilliant bill. It represented put Georgia and one of the leading states in the country to not only handle the predator crisis and problem, but also that would have been fair. The bill has been watered down to the point where it's not publicly available for persons to read to know what's happening. When you sit in this room, it appears as though it's progressing, but there's a lot of arbitrary language that uh, fortunately I understand it, but the public doesn't. I feel like my 5,000 followers that I represent are not being heard or have a position for a voice. I was discriminated against and removed from the committee, which uh, these are things I'm going to take up in an ethical draft when I leave here today. But the bill started out great. They did, wrote a beautiful <coughs> bill. What happened between then, I don't know, but my reason for being here is we have a predator culture in Georgia that is being overlooked. Uh, there's ability to protect the citizens of Georgia that's not happening. My hometown of Thomaston, Georgia uh, has treated me abusively. I used to be the clothier for former President Ronald Reagan. He respected me immensely. The state of Georgia has treated me like a second-class citizen. And to me, I, I'm, t I'm totally upset and, and, and confused well, by that. I understand you are. I think you know, what we're, we're, of course, we're the lawyers who make up most of this committee. Not all of us, but I think everyone here today is, is a member of the bar. And we're trying to do what we see to be the right thing for all the citizens and also recognizing what we call policy of the state that needs to be addressed. So yeah, I, I fully understand the, the full yes. perspective. My point is, is that I would be, I would be hardened if uh, the if the model client, the 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 lobbyist, I mean the uh, legislative expert, is also the private attorney of the client, who is the model client for the bill. Mm -hmm. To me, I find this to be uncomfortable in that he's getting privileged. He's able to walk around behind the Judiciary uh, Committee, hand out passes. Well, let's, let's keep it to the know. facts but, of the bill, if you would. Okay, well, the facts of the bill is that window <coughs> legislation that was written into the bill is the best legislation. It puts Georgia ahead. It creates the solution for the predator crisis, and it also is fair to victims. Right. I would like to see financial caps put on settlements so that it could be a win-win versus um, – you know, being total. Mr. Clark may like to address you on that one. <laughs> no, no. I, 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 victims want settlement yes, caps. Yeah, this, yeah. The lawyers want a, a major payday, but that's not what victims yeah. want. They want to eat. They want to get closure to get their power back, and they want settlement caps. So I that hope everybody that when wins. we get through the bill, of course, we're we're one step in the long process too. That before the bill becomes law, but we are trying to make sure that what we're putting out is a good bill, and we hope you'd be happy with it. I think there's it. a happy medium somewhere, yes, but sir. I'm not we're seeing it happen. To. All right. Well, let's see what comes out of it. <coughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, too. All right. Yes, I Anyone else want to address the committee? If you have something brief you'd like to say, please do. Chairman Willard and uh, committee, we are uh, so grateful that we have had these many hearings and these many discussions, and we feel very strongly that we have advanced the discussion of policy as relates to child sexual abuse and, and child rape victims' rights, and that's what we're here to do. Um, I just want to voice my concerns um, over the bill. My concerns are that it is um, very predator-friendly. My concerns are that we have um, now discussion over opening um, what would be records for victims to be able to prosecute, prosecute uh, not prosecute, but bring civil charges. Um, my concerns are that um, we have uh, have lowered the standard um, and and we have heightened um, the barriers for victims. We've heightened those barriers um, with our discovery rules in our courts, and we've heightened those barriers um, in in the uh, clear and convincing evidence um, versus what we originally proposed, which was negligence. That's only as to a employer after the statute of limitations has right. run. And just um, now, let me let me I know. 
we're trying to do something here that's a really a major a major step <clears throat> and I think that what we're facing is how do we do the balancing of the equity rights of everybody involved including most of all those who have been harmed and we're so Just grateful a, I don't want to yeah. so sound ungrateful Let me I'm saying please ma'am uh, what we've put together here is something I think is very unique in Georgia we do not have legislation or laws that provide for opening up of a statue of this nature we're doing something quite unique and it's beyond what I, I, I'm aware of as far as anything else we've ever done in Georgia, believe me. And I, I think all of us have a great concern about there are people out there who are the predators who, as Mr. Spencer talks about, have gotten away with it. And, that, and for that reason, for that primary reason, this committee is facing how can we now open that up where those people who have been harmed have the ability to address that before a court of law. And that's what we're doing. But we've got at the same time recognize the needs to balance the, the, the rights of the persons or corporations or businesses that may be involved into this to be sure that they have a chance to defend themselves about it. And it is our and goal that we only um, expose those predators um, with I all due respect. Are. So we thank but you very much. And um, <coughs> we hope that this bill moves forward and that we will take whatever victories we can get. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I know that I came in late. I apologize because I was having to present another bill, another committee. All but right. uh, but uh, I think that um, um, a, a count, legislative council could probably answer some questions about Section 5 that came up um, as far as the drafting there. I know that she worked on that for us. Um, could, could we ask Ms. Travis yeah, to sure. address some of those questions for us? Five and six, I think it was. Yes, ma'am. So in court, and I know y'all don't have the book in front of you, but in, uh, okay, nor is it in the bill, but in uh, Code Section 49-5-40, we define, they have definitions and, and it has to do with these reports of sexual abuse or physical <coughs> abuse and child abuse. And very clearly in Subsection B, we say every record that's along these lines is declared confidential and access is prohibited except is provided in 49-5-41 and 49-5-41.1 and it says that the, the department can't do it except for uh, if in terms of releasing it except for conducting background checks for foster care and adoptive parents and in fact in 49-5-44 it makes uh, the release of that information a misdemeanor, makes it a crime and so that was why the language um, then if you go to 49-5-41 you'll see many codes, many subsections that allow the release of the information, which is why uh, in Section 5 we added a new subsection to 49-5-41, allowing access to this information, but only when, you know, very limited circumstances when the requester submits a sworn affidavit that is relevant to a proposed uh, <coughs> civil action, which tracks some of the language in here to keep it confidential. And um, then the language, as you can see on lines 146 and 148, sort of mirror that if this were to go into a civil action in the same manner that the district attorney could have been using those records to prosecute, now the victim can use these in the new civil action. So that's the, just the background on sections five and six. It was a very limited need because of the confidentiality of the records and the misdemeanor penalty. Uh, how the question of confidentiality is, I guess, <coughs> one sort of out there hanging. How how is that going to be controlled? So, if necessary. But, um, I'm are you referring to um, lines one thirty four and thirty five? Right. <coughs> so, if this was a circumstance where the, it was an ongoing police investigation. And if you look at 1518, 72, mm -hmm. it says when it's an ongoing police investigation, nobody can get access right. to it until the police are done. So, it's so now it's if, closed. Yeah, so we close that off. We protect that. Stuff. So confidentiality really is addressing what is as they receive it uh, 10 years later or whatever time frame, is there a need to be sure that some type of confidentiality continues with those records once they leave an agency? 
the um, the, well, we partially addressed that in lines 146 through 148, I think, is that you can only use it in the course of a civil action. Um, could you take out a newspaper ad? And <coughs> I don't know. That's, I, I'm not, that's a question. I can't for sure say that I remember thinking about that particular type mm -hmm. of use. <coughs> now, access under Section 41 that we talked about, that it, I addressed earlier, there is a provision where you get a subpoena record-wise. Is that what norm would normally apply to a civil action? I use the term normal since you had some purpose for wanting to get these records in a civil proceeding. Uh, true, but in, I, I, I think that's true, but because the law doesn't allow the um, access to the records after the person reaches the age of 23. Oh, that's... The true okay. So that's that's why we're trying to reach in. Okay, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate, but now we're opening it up past age 23. Right. The court would say, well, now you have that potential right because under this section of the, the bill that we're passing, we're recognizing a uh, opening of that uh, statute, the discovery part of it. The court has that ability. Mm -hmm. I think you make a good point. I think you would, you might still need section six, mm -hmm. um, but section five of the bill might be able to be solved mm -hmm. under that theory. Okay. I'm just asking questions out loud. Any other questions of members of the committee? If not, we'll close off further public input. The bill is now in the breast of the committee. Do we have discussion among committee members? Yes, sir, Judge. I'd like to, at appropriate time, make an amendment, if, if I might. We're going to. Uh, we'll be open up to amendments once we get through. Okay. I just first ask, is there anything that members of the committee want to speak to about the bill as far as a committee discussion on it? <coughs> Ms. Oliver? I want to um, thank um, Chairman Fleming for the time and the quality of attention that um, he's given the author f for this bill. I've been really impressed with the quality of the testimony and uh, the extensive, extensive analysis. And we have um, done a number of different things to the bill, two steps forward, one step back, or one step forward, two steps back. And um, at appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move uh, for due pass for the Consideration of the committee. Uh, certainly, <coughs> entertain a motion and more. Uh, did you have Ms. Evans? Thank you want to make a comment or uh, discussion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, the subcommittee obviously put in a lot of time, and there's a lot of balance and and things put, put into the language that we have before us, and they're to be commended. And I just wanted to know if someone from the subcommittee could comment um, about lines 87 to 88. Why even after there's been this pretrial finding of clear and convincing evidence. We still wanted to say no chance for punitive damages. That's my amendment. Take that okay. out. <laughs> Great mind. <laughs> I promise that's my amendment. How did it come in the bill? I guess who, Mr. Fleming, you want to speak to that? The issue about uh, punitive damages. I'd love to if I could remember. <laughs> um, I think that that was in the subcommittee a a. Um, um, yeah. Miss Beskin yeah, brought that in because of the fear that we would um, we were looking for basically justice here to the extent that you could have it in civil law. We weren't looking to create a, an um, incentive for anybody to bring a case other than, um, and I'm trying to speak for Miss Beskin. Uh, basically, there was concern about how far back we were going and what we were opening up, and the fact that statute of limitations had purposes in our law. We were fixing to do away with them, so we didn't want to open up that area. Um, and that's probably what Miss Beskins would tell you if she were here. That was her proposal, I believe. All right. That helped. Ms. Evans? Yes. 
Judge, did you push your button? Yes, uh, my comment to that was, though, that if it's found by clear and convincing evidence, and that's certainly uh, yonder preponderance, uh, if they, we're going to put some teeth in this thing for people who knew that their employees or their uh, volunteers <coughs> were in fact predators and they have known it, then we need to do something about it, not just for the individual who caused it, but the people who, who protect them, just like the thing up in uh, the football team in uh, Penn State, uh, when it was obvious that the school itself was aware of the, the act. And it's just my opinion that if we don't put some teeth in this, then employers who, and like I say, it's not a preponderance of the evidence. It's clear and convincing, which is that one step further. Yeah. And so I would move at an appropriate time, if that, when, to right. strike, uh, notwithstanding uh, Code Section 1512-5.1, punitive exemption should not be awarded, which is on lines 87 and 88. Thank you, sir. We will... <coughs> Yeah. Entertain motions uh, shortly. Um, any other comments from members of the committee at the moment? The chair will take his progress. I have also been working with this paragraph that begins on line 81 and, and trying to make as much as we can uh, make it relevant and, and sequential as to what we're trying to do in the progression of someone's age and rights they would have. Uh, <coughs> And going back to the issue, I'll have some amendments, and I'll talk about those if you like now. But if you look at, I'm going to read the paragraph, if you indulge me for a minute. Beginning with paragraph uh, 2 on line 81, if the person was a volunteer or employee of an entity that owed a duty of care to the plaintiff, the individual has been harmed, <coughs> or to the person and the plaintiff were engaged in some activity over which such entity had control, damage against such entity shall be awarded under this code section only if there is a finding of negligence by clear and convincing evidence on the part of such entity. My proposal is to strike after that the next phrase, which is provided, however, that if the claim is brought against an entity after the plaintiff attains the age of 23 years, there shall be a pretrial finding of such entity was negligent by clear and convincing evidence. We don't really need to have that. The point is, if there's already been the duty and, and level of evidence required as being clear and convincing, it is not a question of whether it occur, <coughs> occurs before age 23 or after age 23. We're keeping the same standard there. Then we would add the next phrase, which is continue with uh, notwithstanding code section 5112, 51, which may be something to be offered as an amendment, but that's that, at least in my uh, putting together this paragraph that stayed. Then the next part, we can strike out paragraph D in its entirety because it's not needed again. Your standard of clearing and convincing will be what the court will address uh, under motions for summary judgment, for instance. Uh, one last thing I was suggesting I'm going to offer proposed as an amendment is to put in here uh, a definition, which we don't have really in law at all, on what is the clear and convincing evidence as a standard. And uh, back when I was doing the forfeiture code, we uh, had that as a proposal, did not go forward with that, but we did put together a definition, which I'll read to the committee out loud. Clear and convincing evidence means proof that will produce in the mind of the trier of facts a firm belief or conviction as to the allegations sought to be established. It is intermediate, being more than a mere preponderance, but not to the extent of certainty as is required beyond a reasonable doubt. Now that is what we have as a, that is a definition that's come out of case law uh, that I suggest we might want to have inserted as a part of the definitions under paragraph C, where we say as used in this subsection, the term, and then we have entity and person. So at the appropriate time, I may be offering that as an amendment to the, uh, for the committee's consideration. Uh, Mr. Weldon, is that yours? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, I appreciate what you say about these, the, your, your, yeah 
perspective on these. I was just wondering why in, why the subcommittee put that language in there on page 85 through uh, 87, uh, ending with the word evidence, period, or word evidence, and then the following period. Before you, the, which line are you talking about? I'm sorry. 80, 85 through 87, and you, you discussed it. Just delete that. It delete it, yes. yes. We're, we're probably going to take out after the semicolon and make that a period. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And I would just wonder if I could pose that to uh, the chairman subcommittee, uh, Fleming, as to where that, what was the impetus it, for that it, language? Okay. And maybe I can respond to you like to Please. because it was it was part of my doing. Oh, okay. And what we were trying to do was differ differentiate between the circumstances of this coming about as to a person prior to their reaching age 23. Uh, there would be an immediate right to bring an action against this potential uh, employer as opposed to after age 23 when the statute has run and now we're getting into this period of time we call the discovery period <coughs> and to have some uh, ability for the employer to defend itself uh, before the court uh, prior to saying this case is going to go forward with other discovery needs oh. so I, I but I thought about it and the way we have it here is is really having the court do the same thing that the trier of fact has to do and that's really putting the court in the wrong position the court not the one to do the trying of facts by what is what is necessary in meeting a standard of clear and convincing evidence mm -hmm. evidence is a factual issue yes now, Thank you. with that said, we have one last thing, which I think is a, a good provision that we're doing here, because what we're trying to recognize <clears throat> is we want to open this up for a period of two years. So the people that you're talking about, Mr. Spencer, <laughs> the ones you've had uh, working with you and uh, your knowledge of, that there will be an opening for a period of two years. Uh, for them to come forward and bring a legal action against those who are the predators that have harmed them. And I, I, if you look at the Amendment AM 29-2376, we had this drawn up, and I'm going to read this out loud, I think it's important. It is express intent of the General Assembly that for a period of two years following July 1st, 2015, that's when this becomes an a actual law, Plaintiffs of any age, any age, who were time barred from filing a civil action for injuries resulting from childhood sexual abuse due to the expiration of the statute of limitations in effect on June 30th, 2015, shall be permitted to file such actions against the individual alleged to have committed such abuse before July 1st, 2017, thereby reviving those civil actions which had lapsed or technically expired under the law in, the, in effect on June 30th, 2015. The revival of a claim as provided in paragraph 1 of this section shall, shall not apply to A, any claim that has been litigated to finality on the merits in a court of competent jurisdiction, termination of a prior civil action on the basis of the expiration of the statute of limitations shall not be should not constitute a claim that has been litigated to finality on its merits, however. B, any written settlement agreement which has been entered into between a plaintiff and defendant when the plaintiff was represented by an attorney who was admitted to practice law in the state, in this state at the time of the settlement, and the plaintiff signed such agreement. So if there was just like a threat forcing out a settlement, that could be questioned by the court. C, any claim against any entity. I'm sorry, any claim against an entity as such term is defined in subsection C of this code section. And F, on and after July 1st, 2017, this code section shall be applied only prospectively. So that is the amendment that we're proposing to address what is one of the major concerns Mr. Spencer's raised with this entire matter. And uh, with that, uh, if there's further comment, is just a question for the chair on the amendment um, I, th I think it's great that you're bringing this forward and I just was 
curious about the thought process on why lines 23 through 24, why exclude the entities from this? Well, we did that, again, because there's, there's I go back, if you had something open up 20 years later, how is the, how is the employer where people have either left, uh, there's no known ability to defend itself at that point in time. And I, I've heard from Mr. Spencer and others, the main thing they want to do is be sure these perpetrators who have caused injury to individuals in their community are brought out, that they're exposed for what they've done. Is that right, Mr. Spencer? Uh, that is that is correct. Um, uh, but I, I, will, I will state that um, I do want to be able to um, expose those entities that knowingly covered it up. That is my concern. Right. Yeah. Well, by those entities, I, again, I'm looking at the question at 20 years later, how, how will that entity, if it's still in existence, be able to defend itself? That's, and I heard er, loud and clear yeah. that you wanted the people who had been harmed by some individual in the community. The light shone on them is what they've done. Right? Correct. So I don't want to have this become a witch hunt. That's why I did it. Yes, sir. Uh, wait. Over here, Mr. Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, question uh, on the amendment. Uh, line 25, it, it speaks to this code section will be applied only prospectively um, after July 1st. Are we not wanting to apply these standards that you're that we've outlined in the code section during the litigation that might arise f within these next two years from when it could be opened up? Well, the, the, the issue about the discovery period will continue. Is that what you're <coughs> talking about? Well, it, I, unless I was misunderstanding, the, this applies to the, to the, new, the code section 9-3-33.1. And if that's all the discovery, then then I think it's fine. I, I, I was trying to figure out if that was also going to pertain to the new burdens of proof that was being applied. Yeah, the, the, if this is drafted so that it's clearly that this is um, what I'm going to call line 6 through 24 is the window. Okay. That the window closes. And so if, so if one is, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, may I continue? Sure. So just so I understand, so that if someone is just, if, if an entity comes forward during the window, then, then oh, I'm sorry, if a person is discovered or a victim comes forward during the window, then that, then the standards we're talking about with clear and convincing, that will still apply to that person during this, during the window, right? My concern is that line 81, we're setting forth that if a person or volunteer has a duty of care, then they can be liable <coughs> for, da for damages. Yeah, uh, well, um, so, so that line 81, that only deals with an entity. Okay. I think that, that, that the that line 23 of the amendment completely shuts out anybody's claim against an entity at all. Okay. But... When it's open for two what two years? Right. It's during the window. Um, what I'm trying, what I'm trying to make sure in my mind is clear. What about the person, though? Okay. <coughs> we have several stages here. We got normal statute of limitation up to age 23. This law becomes effective. We've now added the ability through a discovery period that will say someone who later through therapy and otherwise becomes aware that they have been sexually abused as a child. That would open up based on the court determination. Thirdly, we're giving this two-year special opening under regardless 
of somebody coming in and saying, I was abused, I don't have anything else to prove it standard-wise, but that person is the one who did it to me as a perpetrator. Okay. And I'm suing for damages. And is in that person the, the, the perpetrator? The perpetrator is the standard for proving his or her um, culpability and the, and the amount of damages that the victim suffered. That that is that set forth in the in the code section that becomes effective only prospectively. There's no measure of damages okay. supplied <coughs> in the law. This law. This bill. Is that way? Okay. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Weldon? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 I hear you on the, in your, your comments about how a an entity would be able to protect himself after 20 years. Um, but if in the event we have a situation where an entity knew or should have known about this inappropriate conduct occurring by this volunteer or this person that they owed a duty to, um, and we're allowing the revival of the claim for the against the the person who did it, but that that entity is still. But for like like the Penn State situation, but for that entity, that conduct wouldn't have occurred if they knew or they should have known and they allowed it to happen. Um, I just I have I'm just concerned about the the entity not being required to answer for their the issues that they the entity not being allowed to or not either. not being held to the standard. Or being required to answer for their complicity in this situation. Well, and I, I understand and appreciate that we're doing something very unusual here that we've never done in Georgia. And as I said earlier, I did want to have what we're opening up here to be allowed to be <coughs> run with where, where parties could, through counsel, seek finding ways to file a lawsuit against businesses when there's questionable whether they can even defend themselves against it. Well, sure, well, we don't know. Yes, sir. Well, can so we allow it to be open for what I heard to be the harm, the statute of limitations having run, and these individuals wanting to expose the person who was a perpetrator against them. That's what I'm talking about. Now, if you hold up all the way, I don't think you can see anything. I mean, you're talking about where you want a whole loaf or the best part of the loaf you can get something like this. If you go too far, it's not going anywhere. I, I, that right now, ladies and gentlemen. Be, be understanding where you are with what you're trying to do as, as a different approach in recognizing a way to address the specific harm that we're talking about occurring to an individual. Anything further? <coughs> the chair will now entertain motions. Ms. Ms. Oliver. I move to pass, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion to pass. Is there a second? Second. Motion second. Any discussion on the motion? The chair will entertain any amendments. Do you have an amendment? I've got Mr. Uh, Judge, excuse me. I'm not Judge sure the mine applies if your amendment <laughs> goes forward. <laughs> If your amendment goes forward, I will withdraw mine. If not, then I would I would move to strike on lines 87, starting with the word notwithstanding through the end of line 88. Well, you, you're saying if my amendment goes forward, which amendment are you talking about? The I, one as far as the statute of limitations part or what? Yes, what well, you say in a claim against an entity is termed in this section they wouldn't couldn't sue them, I guess is what I'm saying. Oh, my, okay, that's good, so I, I move then, my amendment is to strike, yep. starting on line 87, with the word notwithstanding through the end of line 88. Just strike that. 
discussion on the motion? Do we have a second? It's been seconded. Is there a discussion on the motion? Yes, sir, Mr. Fleming. I, I certainly understand your intention, Judge, and in, in what you're talking about doing. But like the chairman, I want to see a version of this bill move forward. And if you seek to bite off more than possibly could be digested, I'll say, I worry that um, the whole effort may stall. So that was the thought when Ms. Beskin offered that in subcommittee. And, of course, that's up to the committee as a whole to make the decision <coughs> whether or not that harms the bill moving forward or it helps it. Thank you. Well, of course, when you're doing punitive damage, you're going further than that. Right, that's what I'm saying. So, but but that's that's the issue. Do we have any further discussion on the uh, Call Caldwell Amendment? If not, the chair will call with a question. All in favor of the Caldwell Amendment, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. No. Chair is uncertain. It will ask for a division of the House, a division of the committee, rather. All in favor, raise your hand. <clears throat> All opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Amendments added. Strike, striking the uh, line, uh, notwithstanding code section 51-12-5.1, punitive damages shall not be awarded pursuant to this paragraph. <clears throat> uh, other amendments from members of the committee? The chair will propose amendment. The chair's amendment is to strike, beginning on line <coughs> 85, mm -hmm. the word provided, however, phrase rather than all through down to line 87, the uh, ending of the sentence convincing evidence. We'll strike that and then add, instead of a semicolon, a period after entity on line 85. Second. Then a motion seconded. Any discussion on the motion? The chair will call for the question. All in favor of the Willard Amendment 1 signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. The chair has a second amendment, which will be to strike the paragraph identified as paragraph D, beginning on line 89 down to 80, 91, the entire sentence. The chair so moves. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion on Willard Amendment 2, if not the chair. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask a question? So um, you're getting rid of the six-month filing. That's, that's the goal. Okay. That's it. All right. <coughs> chair, call the Willard Amendment 2 for vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. <coughs> <coughs> okay. I thought you were going to move. That's what I'm. That we'll look at now. Yeah, we're going back up to we strike having st struck the paragraph D. We're going back now up to line seventy-five. At the end of the sentence on line seventy-five, the chair will have motion to. Add the following: The pretrial finding required by this subparagraph shall be made within six months of the filing of the civil action. Second. Yes, sir. To so read that as being this, we have a discovery rule. It's opened up. It could be 20 years later, and they are brought. They have brought an action to uh, seek damages, then there will be a, a finding within the time frame of six months to make the decision uh, to whether this this paragraph shall be made within uh, the pretrial finding, sorry, required. We have a pretrial finding here, and that will be done within six months. Chair will so move. Second. Second. The moves and second. This is Willard Amendment number three. Any discussion on the amendment? All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed like sign. Motion carries. One last 
amendment we'll have is the Willard Amendment number four, <coughs> which is AM. Oh, yeah, I got, thank you. I got the clear and convincing evidence standard we're talking about. The Willard Amendment number four is under the section C to add at the uh, placement by uh, Legislative Council a paragraph giving the definition of clear and convincing evidence as was read by uh, chair earlier in the meeting. The chair will move for that being added as the Willard Amendment number four. Second. No, sir. This is the clear and convincing evidence clear you have evidence. in your file. Second. The move is second. <clears throat> Discussion on the amendment. Not the chair will call the question. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, <coughs> like sign, motion carries. The Willard Amendment number five will be AM 29 2376 in your folder. This is the clarification on the, the time frame of the uh, bill uh, enactment of the, ex what, what's what I'm looking for? Revival provision. Thank you. And this was read earlier. Is there. This will be offered as Willard Amendment number five. Is there a second on the motion? Second. It has been seconded. Second. And uh, discussion on the amendment? Is there any discussion? Mr. Welch. Mr. Chairman, just to make sure I followed it. Where, where did we put the clear and convincing evidence? I left it up to her as a part of those definitions on okay. page. Then does the... Does the so we, we've struck paragraph D um, at line 89. So we, do we need to re-letter re the amendment uh, for, and make those D and E as opposed to E and F? Well, D being eliminated, there's nothing going below that. I thought I thought this your amendment, your fifth oh, amendment, was going in. Well, that will go in as a separate. Would that go in a separate section? No, no. Under there, E. We'll make that D. Yeah, we'll put that as D. So you make that D and E. All right. So one at a time, please. It has to be recognized so we don't have confusion people talking. Go ahead. Yeah, all I was suggesting, Mr. Chairman, was that since we've struck D, we would need to re-letter your, um, your amendment to be D and, F, D and E as, par as, as opposed to E and F. Correct. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Fleming, you were want to be recognized or no? no? Anyone else need to be recognized? So what, why don't you offer those amendment to the uh, Willard Fifth Amendment? So we're changing E to D and F to E. Lines 6 and 25. Well, if there's no objection to that amendment, the amendment will be taken by the chair. Uh, we now call for the, the any discussion on the amendment, Willard Amendment 5, <coughs> as amended. If not, the chair calls the question. All in favor of Willard Amendment number 5, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, like sign, motion carries. Are there any other amendments? If there are no further amendments, the chair will call for the main question. That question is a due pass to House Bill 17, LC 29, 6537S, as amended as a committee substitute. Yes, ma'am. Did you want to do anything about Section 5? Or no? You got a good point. I forgot about that. We talked about that. Ms. Travis, back to where we were, Ms. Travis has raised the issue about Section 5, which we talked about as being the recognition of how you are able to obtain access to these records of the state and the issue was we have a provision in the law that addresses that accessibility in civil actions does it want to make a motion to either delete section 5 if not we'd leave it in there but is there what's the prerogative of the committee they might have a motion if there's no motion we'll leave it as is Back. Any further amendments to the uh, HB 17? If not, 
<clears throat> the chair will call the question, which is a due pass of HB 17 uh, as amended and as a s committee substitute. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There'll be no further. Oh, you will get your bills. All right. Take a second. All right. Do House Bill uh, 354. 524. Mr. Fleming. Mr. Chairman, thank you. In the interest of time, I'd ask the committee to hold House Bill 354, but I would like to move ahead with House Bill 524. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, we, we passed uh, last hey, year. Be, hold on. Quiet, please. Still doing business. You wish to leave, do so as quietly as you can. Mr. Mr. Chairman, House Bill 524 is the exact same bill we passed out of this committee last year, but the governor vetoed it. We fixed what the governor didn't like and brought it back to you. This is the trade name registry bill. As you know, the clerks of courts through the clerk's authority have uh, put everything online in the clerk's office, deeds and whatnot for the state of Georgia. The trade name registry is the last thing that they were going to put online. They did that by charging a $5 fee for filing. The governor asked him not to do that, so the bill has been brought back to you without the $5 fee, and it's the same bill as last year. We have a motion. <coughs> do pass. Second. Motion, do pass, second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Bill passes. No further business to come before the committee. We'll stand adjourned.